Oh, thank God, it's just the $40 Animal Crossing DLC that adds literally every old character and feature back into the game like they should have had in the first place. Alright, fine. When Sword and Shield were announced, there were some astonishingly poor decisions which came along with it. Initially, I said to myself and anyone who asked, you know what? No. I'm putting my foot down. Either Nintendo pushed Game Freak to make some horrible decisions regarding Sword and Shield or Game Freak is acting of its own accord. Either way, I do not want to support this game. But eventually, the barrier broke, and I decided to give this game a spin to see if it's truly as bad as I thought it was gonna be. I thought to myself, if this thing's actually bad, maybe I can save some poor soul from grabbing it despite this thing being out for a while now. And if it's better than I thought, then good for everyone involved. There will definitely be quite a bit of talk about the mechanics compared to previous gens, but I also intend to really cover how the story plays out as well. Oh, and a couple of things before we get on with this. One, no ad this time, but I've got some limited time shirts for this video as well if you have any interest in picking one up. And two, promoting my Twitch at the start of the video last time definitely helped. So hey, I stream on Twitch. All right, let's just, let's just jump in. We start off by watching a YouTube-esque video, which is jarring, but all right. I was wondering how we would one-up the weird laptop opening from Sun and Moon, and here we are. So this guy named Rose introduces himself like every other Pokemon professor type, and then he throws out this thing. What is it with introductory sequences going, Welcome to this world of mystical creatures. Here's one of the lamest ones we've got. So then we get introduced to the Pokemon champion of the Galar region, who... Uh, okay, okay. So I'm actually an advocate of the cape. Capes need to make a comeback and this guy's trying his best. What I'm not an advocate of is wearing a cape with tights and biker shorts. What in the... All right, how far am I into this video? Am I past the no swearing mark? Okay, good. What in the fuck outfit is this? Then Leon here shows off Britain's finest terrifying technology of transforming Pokemon into the size of a skyscraper. I cannot see how this goes wrong when a Charizard decides to unleash a 40 foot high flamethrower into an open seating stadium chock full of human beings. Thankfully, Game Freak decided to pan away from the surely dead bodies that are now crumbling in their seats looking like Luke Skywalker's aunt and uncle. So we pan back to reality where our guy is watching his YouTube video, when suddenly an action speaks at us. I'm about as confused as you are by that statement, but yeah, apparently someone decided to name their child after a verb for some reason. I absolutely cannot wait to meet Sip, Grab, and Fart as the other main children of this game. Oh, it gets better though. You might think, well, if this guy's got any siblings, they're probably named some weird shit like that too. But no, this guy's brother is the champion who I was just watching. And like I said, that guy's name is Leon. So basically, Leon's mom rolled a natural one after squeezing out Hop here. Maybe it's just a nickname. Hopefully it's just a nickname. So Hop leaves and I stare in disbelief for a while before getting up and good God, I'm fast. I mean, I don't know if I'm that fast, but I feel quick. Already game of the year in my eyes. But then we get a loading screen in a Pokemon game and I'm served a grim reminder to temper my expectations. So we head to Hop's place, his mom tells him his brother isn't there yet, and then we run into town while Hop safeguards me from stumbling into tall grass on purpose. Then we make it to his brother who's busy posing for random civilians. Imagine a real life athlete or something doing some crazy ass great Saiyan man poses and people going nuts. So we head back and Leon has a Pokemon for us. We've got this water tadpole thing, a fire bunny, and the Beastie Boy special, a grass monkey. They all run to their respective terrain, except there's no trash fire for the bunny, so it just sets the basketball court on fire. That one's my favorite and the only obvious choice here. I mean, let's be honest, I like Grookey too, but look at this little bun. That is adorable. Well, Hop decides to continue the tradition of rivals choosing the Pokemon yours is strong against because fuck it, why not? And then challenges you to set his grass Pokemon on fire. All right, couple of things. First off, the champion takes the last Pokemon, which is cool. I actually like that a lot, so at least there's that going for the whole choose your Pokemon thing. Secondly, Hop starts with two Pokemon, which is a nice way to even the odds, kind of. Of course, to lose to him, you'd probably have to growl 40 times in a row, but you know, still neat. But the most important thing here is that your Pokemon level up and learn moves within battle, which is actually a pretty significant game changer when it comes to close battles. I imagine in actual competitive stuff, this wouldn't happen. 
but it threw me off when my score bunny learned Ember just in time to barbecue Hop's monkey. I gotta say, I don't think there's been a line of dialogue out of the old champion here where he hasn't opened by stating that he's the champion or he owns a Charizard. Good personality. So we head back to my mom's place to tell her I won't be seeing her for the rest of the game, probably. And it turns out that a Wooloo has rolled its rotund body out of the gate here into a, um, forbidden area? Apparently we live right next to a forbidden area. So we go looking for this little sheep and instead find this dog with some sausages flowing off its head. As much as I want to give this battle shit, it's actually kind of cool and reminds me a lot of running through Lavender Tower without the Sylph scope in the way that this Pokemon has no level and our moves don't affect it. Well, eventually it knocks us out with fog and when we wake up, Hop is dead on the ground, most of his body consumed by the... Nah, he's fine. The Pokemon knocked us out just because and this area isn't really dangerous by any means, apparently. Leon comes in and we tell him about the experience and he's just as confused as us about the whole ordeal. So now we can finally head off into the world, sort of. I gotta say, it's a bit jarring to see Pokemon on the overworld. I actually like it and dislike it at the same time. Part of me loves being able to see what I would encounter and being able to dodge a lot of encounters if need be. And part of me misses not knowing what's going to pop up. But I'd say that overall I enjoy the change. So I pocket a little bluebird and press on to the actual Pokemon professor of the Galar region, Professor Magnolia. Okay, so I wasn't gonna mention this, but when we told Leon about the whole mysterious fog Pokemon, he was like, hmm, well maybe if you get stronger, you can come back to try to find whatever it was. But generally, he didn't seem to have an interest in it. Then we get to the professor's assistant here and she's like, have you come to continue to bug me about finding super rare one-of-a-kind Pokemon? So I guess this asshole just thought we got high off the fog here and passed out instead of looking for the legendary Pokemon himself. Anyways, this is Sonya. Apparently, she used to be Leon's rival, in addition to being the assistant to the professor. So she's the loser who Hop will be joining by the end of this game. So we carry on before reaching the end of the tutorial bit here. I gotta say, in terms of sheer beginnings, Pokemon Sword isn't particularly unique, but it certainly does iterate the old formula of average Pokemon beginnings pretty damn well. I'm actually having fun and I really can't complain too much about everything that's gone down so far. Eventually, we make it to Professor Magnolia, who's an older lady living down in this beautiful area. Leon immediately asks the professor about the so-called Dynamax phenomenon, which is obviously the thing we witnessed where Charizard turned into Godzilla at the start of the game. But she's like, nah, I don't know shit about that, stop asking. An interesting thing about this particular region of the world is that in order to take on the gym leaders, you need an endorsement from a particularly high up and proven trainer in the world, which I actually like a lot. While we may still be children in this game, as is tradition, I like the idea that not just anyone can roll up on a gym and try to take it on. Obviously, Leon would be the person that we could try to get to endorse us, but he wants to see us battle again before doing so. Now let's talk about Hop as a character. Hop is pretty goddamn annoying. He reminds me a lot of your rival in Gen 4, Barry. He's very quick to rush into everything, overzealous to a fault, and worst of all, the guy is so cocksure in his knowledge. He constantly lectures about all of the knowledge that he's scrounged up from reading books and watching his brother, yet he picked the type that's weak to yours despite having the opportunity not to. And on top of that, he does this whole, huh, I see you learned about type matchups, whenever I inflict super effective damage on his Pokemon. He's actually more akin to a mixture of Barry and Howe, which are some of the worst rivals in the series in my opinion. And ironically, after you defeat him, Hop's like, and I threw my Pokeball perfectly in everything. Like, which one are you, a fountain of knowledge or naivety? And on top of all of that, the dude constantly talks about how he's going to become some legendary hero of Pokemon or something, and it's just annoying after a while. Either way, Leon congratulates us on a great match despite it being me wiping the floor with Hop with a single Pokemon. I really do wish there were multiple dialogues for these types of things besides if you win or lose. It'd be really cool to see Leon react differently if it was a super close battle or really one-sided. But hey man, it's 2021. That's futuristic 2077 technology we're talking about. Well, right after we get our endorsements, our Dynamax fuel literally falls from the sky so that we can make our Pokemon big. 
I guess we could have just gotten the bands from the professor like every other game, but hey, why not make the required piece literally fall from heaven first instead? That doesn't feel awkward at all. Well, now it's time to head off to do gym stuff and, uh... So I bought this game for my wife so that she could play alongside me and apparently that means that this bullshit that you see on screen starts appearing after a certain amount of time since she's questing as well. I get the idea of it and it's cool in a way if you're playing over the internet with your friends, but when I can look over at my wife's screen and see what she's doing, it seems more than a little annoying. Apparently there is no way to turn this off. Are you out of your mind? Is this really an issue one and a half years after the game's release? I looked it up and the only way to reliably turn off these stupid little notifications besides turning your switch on and off is to turn your switch on airplane mode. But even when I did that, they still pop up when I do something notable like catch a new Pokemon. Fucking what? People complained about this immediately on the game's release. But I guess that Game Freak was too busy shoveling $30 DLC at people to be asked to actually add a real quality of life change to the game. Either way, we're off to the next city. But our ride gets cut short when a herd of Wooloo continue to make sure that they're the ultimate antagonist of the game by blocking the train tracks, which gives us the opportunity to go camping and catching in a vast wild area. And I'm actually not too upset about that at all, honestly. As much as I just bitched about the YCOM, Game Freak immediately launches itself back into the graces of neutrality by giving us a way to access our Pokemon storage box on the go. That is an absolutely fantastic addition to the franchise, and I really can't get mad about the YCOM thing because of it, so great call there. So let's talk about the super off-putting gimmick that is Dynamaxing. So there are these little places of power all around the map here where you can fight these gigantic Pokemon called Dynamax Pokemon, and you can invite others to raid with you or you can just play with NPCs. And it's such a weird mechanic. I think that Game Freak thought this would be a fun way to do something unique, and I really can't fault them for trying it. But I really don't enjoy the mechanic if I'm going to be fully honest. All the battles feel nearly exactly the same, and I'd probably feel better about them if they tended to be only super rare Pokemon, or only happened rarely in general. But the Pokemon that you encounter seem like they can be nearly anything, and it makes facing down some of them kind of laughable. On top of that, they tend to be a much higher level than most of your Pokemon team, which is super odd to me, honestly. Like, it's almost always going to be an instant power boost to my party, and it almost feels cheap to find a decent Pokemon at a much higher level with minimal effort. But the speedrunning of levels does not stop there. This game is nuts when it comes to pure XP gain. You can catch Dynamax Pokemon, but you can also run into ridiculously powerful Pokemon out in the field that actually can't be caught. Like I had a level 31 Haunter take on my average level of maybe 12 or 13 team, which is insane. And it probably would have wiped me if it wasn't for the fact that it killed itself. But the XP gain was absolutely batshit for my team. And I'm not even sure how to... Like I know it sounds strange, but I'm so put off by these gains that I don't even know how to build my team anymore. I get candies from Dynamax battles, which increase my Pokemon's XP by lots. I can gain XP by camping with them. The whole game is just XP simulator. And I really don't know how to feel because while I love how fast I can get a team going, I'm just not used to it at all. I don't even know if I'm over leveled at this stage. I guess if I were to summarize all of this, I would say that these mechanics seem to fly in way sooner than you would expect them to. It almost feels like Dynamaxing should have come mid to late game. And on top of that, this whole area feels like a mishmash of just biomes, almost like a safari zone. And again, this is like an hour or so into the game. Now, all of that said, there is a hard level cap which increases when you start fighting gyms, and this affects which level of Pokemon you can catch. And I actually do like that, because as much as this whole process threw me for a loop at first, I'm glad that I can't invalidate my game by basically catching some level 40 beast with little to no effort, even if there was a chance that it wouldn't obey me. At this stage, the game definitely brings a new coat of paint to the franchise, even if that code is a little hindered by Dynamax Pokemon in my eyes. Basically, I went from manually grinding to a certain level with each Pokemon to choosing whoever will get the job done against these overpowered monsters across this vast field. My goal now is more about having my whole team hit or get close to the catch level cap before moving on, and it has me going about increasing my team level in a pretty different way over previous games. 
It's an interesting system and I'm not fully opposed to it, honestly. I will say that in order to keep my Pokemon alive without a Pokemon Center out here, I do have to set up camp to make curry, which can become pretty tedious if I repeatedly get half of my party wiped out by a stronger Pokemon. I guess it's more about how long the process takes rather than it actually being difficult. And I think that's my biggest gripe at this stage. A lot of this grind feels artificially extended by Dynamax cutscenes and cooking cutscenes, which sucks. Because if you're gonna give me a fast track to gather XP, let me skip the same boring cutscenes I've seen over and over. And the most irritating part about all of this is that Game Freak actually had the foresight to put in a skip cutscenes option, but it only works on story cutscenes, as does the skipping of battle animations only work on actual attack animations. Great options, shitty implementation. All right, so I finally make it to Motostoke, which is a cool name for a city, honestly. And it looks neat. And this game just keeps tossing new things at me. You've got your trainer card, which you can customize. Perfect. You've got little jobs you can send your Pokemon on, which I thought was kind of neat in its own way, especially with the way that it encourages me to catch different types of Pokemon to help with particular jobs. And I didn't mention it before, but as you're running around and interacting with these little red holes in the ground, you're constantly gaining a currency known as Watts, which can be traded around the area for some of the best TMs in the game. Actually, these ones in particular harken back to the TMs from older games, which break in one use. These TMs which break in one use are actually known as TRs, which of course stands for Technical Machines. Don't look it up, that's what it stands for. I think this system is a pretty good balance as far as getting endgame moves goes, because originally you'd have a shop where you can buy the good stuff with money, and you'd have to buy each one to outfit your team with Earthquake over and over. Then they made it so that your TMs were infinite use, so it felt kind of easy to get your team decked out. Now you've got that system mixed with this new one which combines the two. It's a good call. And now I'm just exploring, kind of. Instead of some police officer going, well there fella, the earth just split open here from a swarm of diglets. You're gonna have to wait for a bit. Our guy just sees a dude freaking out about the lifts being able to take him up and down the city and he politely backs away so as to not interrupt his raving. Also, we're still in a world where I have to pay before seeing what I can do with my hair in this game, which is great. I like how I get my hair did and the lady goes, by the way, you cannot wear a hat now. Yeah, thanks for warning me on that one. So I finally head into the gym area here, which is a gigantic soccer-esque stadium. I believe that's how all gyms are set up here in this region, but I'm sure we'll find that out after we watch this very obvious antagonist character brush their ridiculous hair back and walk out. If you ever needed something that epitomizes Hop, it's this scene where he scornfully looks at and comments on the guy walking out with his smug look, and then proceeds to smugly demand that the registration worker here sign him up quicker. Well, after getting signed up, I chat up the two characters who stand out here. The first one is the guy from before who proceeds to tell me that I shouldn't be wasting his precious time by talking to him and then proceeds to stand importantly by himself while looking in a random direction. And the second is this girl who I recognize from the internet freaking out over her at some point or another, but she don't got nothing important to say. So small thing to note here is that the blonde guy claims to have been endorsed by the chairman of the Pokemon League. That would be the guy from the start of the game, Rose. Apparently, he owns nearly every major business in the region, which, uh... Yeah, thinking he might be a part of some villain plot knowing how Pokemon games tend to roll. Alright, time for a bunch of backstory. So Sonya here elaborates on the legend of some hero way back in the day, and we check all of the boxes that make a Pokemon story a Pokemon story. Some kind of disaster which covered the land in storms. A sword and a shield. A young hero with emphasis on young despite this statue being built to look like Conan the Barbarian with its tree trunk thighs and arms the size of freight yard crates. Yep, details are all, uh, all here. I'm sure we'll find out more later when the chairman's endorsed blonde-haired frizzy lad goes nuts and tries to do something stupid before the chairman steps out and goes, no, 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 you were the chosen one. This was not the way. Team Rocket. Team Aqua and Magma, Galactic, Plasma, Flare, Skull. How did we get from those to Team Yell? Holy shit. Can't even say I'm surprised after Hop, but good God. At least make it rhyme with Team Scream or something. Well, 
All right, so these guys basically follow that girl around who I talked to earlier, whose name is Marnie, and they just cheer her on, but they also kind of get into scuffles and whatnot over her. So, well, they're not really a villainous group. They're just rowdy punks. So they're kind of like Team Skull, except more down to earth in a way. Because Skull still wanted to take people's Pokemon, they were just a herd of dipshits. These guys seem to have good intentions, and they're just misguided. And stupid name aside, I actually don't mind them. Also, I am overleveled as fuck. So it's time to finally get to the stadium here, and man, it's actually really goddamn cool. Honestly, this is probably one of the most cinematic moments in a Pokemon game for me. Because of course you can list the world turning on its head and some legendary Pokemon coming out and screaming at everyone while people look scared, but I mean, I, I don't know. This stadium moment felt so cool, so much more grounded. Every single gym leader is introduced at the same time, save for one of them, and honestly, they all have pretty damn cool designs. Even this baby-faced man who looks like a toddler got strapped to Arnold Schwarzenegger's body. God, this is cool. I wasn't expecting to say that at all. Okay, so initially I thought the gym system was different from previous games because it seemed like it was presented differently. I thought it would be like something where I performed a task for Sun and Moon's island kahunas, and then I would run back to the main stadium and Moto Stoke to take on their leader. But it's just your standard gym puzzles with trainers sprinkled in on your way to the leader. Which, yeah, I'm all right with that. So after this cutscene, we meet up with Leon and the chairman again, who doesn't have anything super important to say yet. But the chairman has his own theme song, so yeah, this guy's definitely a villain. So we grab a way to fly immediately, which involves taking a Corviknight around to places that you've been already. So it's a lot like Sun and Moon again, which is cool. Though it is a bit odd that there isn't a flying animation. I'm not complaining though, honestly. I've gotta say, I'm actually having a blast. I don't know if that's gonna change, but my expectations being near zero probably helped this game to turn them around quite a lot so far. So I carry on through some mines with some really groovy music before running into the blonde frizzy guy from before, whose name is Bede. Uh, Beady, Bade. Yeah, it's gotta be Bede. It's Bede. Anyways, he's super confident and all that. Pretty much the reiteration of every smug, arrogant, overconfident, villainous type which you see in these games. He uses all psychic Pokemon, which makes me wonder if he's going to be the missing eighth gym leader down the line. Because as always, gym leaders stick to one type to test Challenger's metal for some reason. He gets his cheeks beat before blah blah blah, I went easy on you, blah blah, I've memorized your attack style. Yeah, my attack style was using two moves on one Pokemon. At least his battle music sounds like a Mega Man song. So we make it to the Grass Leader's town, which is less of a town and more of a stadium with a handful of buildings around it. The challenge involves herding Wooloo across the map which isn't much of a challenge, but that's totally fine. It's the first gem. I don't expect much. Taking on Milo here is pretty damn cool, though his team does consist of two grass Pokemon against my fire starter, so yeah. But the music's pretty good, and I enjoyed this whole experience. So we head off to the next gym where we encounter Team Shout threatening some dude for his bike. Their reasoning is so that they can use it to chase gym challengers with it until they get tired. Yeah. So I thrash them, and then the guy who was like, Hey, these guys were trying to steal my bike, goes, Here, you can have my bike. Use it. No. No. Fuck, okay, Jesus. Then we run into Jump, who gets blown out as easily as he always has. In fact, I decimate him so badly that he gives me a revive. Now, if that's not an assertion of dominance, I don't know what is. So we continue across this bridge filled with feathers because apparently feathers and bridges in Pokemon games are just a common theme. Then we make it to the next gym town which assaults me with the single worst song I've ever heard in a Pokemon game. Fortunately, the chairman is here with his... handler? She seems particularly strict, which makes me wonder if she's really the evil one who inadvertently causes Rose to do some dumb shit, or if Rose has hired her because he knows how stern she is. Beat is also here, but who cares? So I head through this town which actually feels like a real town, though most of the houses here are pretty boring. There is one, though, with a lady who says that if a gym leader loses enough times to a challenger, that their gym gets demoted to the minor gym circuit, which is interesting to me. I like the concept, but it makes me wonder if the leaders here also switch out their Pokemon depending on the strength of the challenger. Interesting. 
Now, something I didn't mention before which seems super odd to me is the fact that you can purchase these gym uniforms. And at first glance, I thought, oh sweet, I wanna make my uniform different for gym battles. Except for your gym battles, you have to stick to your basic white one. So you can buy the uniform for outside of gyms, but not in them. Doesn't that seem like it would be an obvious addition? So we take on Nessa's funhouse of water pipes and take her out with no issues. Again, the Dynamax thing seems neato in gym battles particularly, but all the ones I fought casually earlier make it less impressive overall. Plus, it's worth noting that I love the idea of the audience chanting for the last part of the pretty damn cool gym battle theme, but it really doesn't match how the song sounds, which kind of sucks. So it's off to the next gym as always. The game actually moves faster than I thought it would, but I'm also okay with that. So we blast Beat again by one-shotting his entire team on our way through some mines. It's worth noting here that Beat has made a pretty constant statement about collecting wishing stars, the things used in conjunction with Dynamax bands to make Pokemon large. I'm sure nothing nefarious is going on here. So we continue on through the cave, take out some more Team Simp members, and eventually run into the third gym leader who sent some members of his own running. As often as these guys run, you'd think they'd be in better shape, but who am I to judge? This is actually the first gym leader that I really enjoy personality-wise, because the reason that he's here in this cave full of water Pokemon is to train his fire team up better. I don't think that's quite how it works from a technical perspective, but I do respect the idea behind it. The guy's a machine who wants to make sure that he's in top shape at all times, and I enjoy the idea that he's not just chilling outside somewhere in his off time. So we head back to the hotel for the night and run into Marnie. She wants to test her team against yours, to which of course I oblige. Not much to be said here, but I do really like her battle music a lot. Something to note here is that the day-night cycle in this game seems to be event-based rather than system clock-based, which is weird considering that we've had a system clock-based cycle since Generation 2. Well, not system-based for some of the earlier ones, you set it on the cartridge and it memorized it. Still, it's pretty unique. I wonder if the post game will go to the system clock instead. Well, the fire gym is actually located in Motostoke, which is interesting. But to suit my favorite gym leader so far, the challenge here is probably one of the most unique and cleverly designed systems that I've had the pleasure of playing in a Pokemon game. So instead of doing puzzles and fighting trainers, your goal is to catch wild Pokemon. You go into a double battle with one of the gym's trainers here and the trainer attacks your Pokemon and tries to keep you from catching the wild Pokemon. This is an extraordinarily clever idea that could have been executed since Gen 3 or so with the existing mechanics, and I have to applaud the devs for coming up with the idea. The actual battle is pretty fun too, as I never expected the guy's normal-sized Arcanine to take a Dynamax water attack from a Gyarados five levels higher than it. I still don't know how that happened, but the battle was fun, or as fun as it can be for a 6v3. Afterwards, Kabu modestly accepts his defeat and explains that he needs to keep training, which is very admirable. The thing that bugs me, and I know this is just a Pokemon thing, but the fact that Hop is always a badge ahead of me as a rival always makes these kind of victories feel lesser in my eyes. Like, I feel even worse for Kabu after he got thrashed literally twice in a row, and it kind of sucks to know that I'm always second, which is something that I've literally never felt with the previous games despite the phenomenon being a pretty regular occurrence. I don't know, maybe I'd feel better if I saw that Hop's matchup was really down to the wire or something. Then I'd at least have the satisfaction of knowing that I'm just that much better. Though I guess with the amount that the guys battled me, I should know that. It just feels bad taking these gym leaders with fun personalities on for their second loss of the day is all. Well, as if the game were listening to me, Bede comes around to challenge Hop, actually. And he wins, as I find out when I reach the gates of the next city. Something tells me that Hop unfortunately won't just disappear, but maybe he'll lag behind me for now at least. Well, Hammerlock is... Man, it's fucking cool. Whole place is built around this gigantic castle which reaches into the sky with various towers and outposts. It looks amazing. It's probably one of my favorite looking towns in a Pokemon game. Damn, that's back-to-back -back favorites. Slow down, Pokemon Sword. So we meet up with Rose and his evil crony, who shows that Rose may indeed be a helpless idiot who's being manipulated by the one who looks like a Disney villain. She pulls Beat off to the side to speak to him about his whole wishing star gathering, 
to which Rose pays no mind. He then excitedly explains that you should meet him in the castle so that he can basically outline his idea to help the world by utilizing the energy source located within wishing stars to replace natural gases and coal. Interesting, but not overly interesting. The half-interest only continues on when I reach the vault of the castle here, which isn't filled with treasure beyond my wildest dreams, but instead some tapestries which basically say, Once upon a time, there were two young heroes. They wished upon a star. Then bad shit happened. Then they looked at a sword and shield. Then they became kings. What a beautiful tale. I'm sure that it won't repeat itself in the form of Hop and myself. Though Sonya here then points out that we only ever worshipped one hero, oddly enough. So maybe Hop dies. Can you imagine? I would easily crown this the king of all Pokemon games if the young child Hop was myrtleized by the hands of a vicious disaster. You know, some people pointed out in my KOTOR 2 video that I would probably be a Sith in real life. I really don't know where they get that idea from, honestly. Oh my god, I... I think... I think I might be falling in love. No! So more team anger noises chaos ensues, and Hop shows up all depressed. I like that, that's actually a good change of pace. Something tells me that he'll still beat the next gym before me though. So we head through this area, right? And we get to this dusty ass town and here's Hop again, ready to battle. Now I know you're thinking, ah, this battle is gonna go the same as always, but you're wrong. He's got a dumbass bird that looks about as stupid as he is with him. No, but seriously, Hop's entire lineup has shifted save his starter after getting thrashed by Bead. I actually like that development a lot because this guy went from shoving his shit-tier Wulu around and acting like he was going to carry it to the Pokemon League to catching whatever strong Pokemon he could find. And that speaks volumes about his attitude, as it goes from, me and my team are the best, and we're gonna knock everyone out on the way to defeating my undefeatable brother, to, I must become stronger by any means necessary, even if it means booting out Pokemon with less potential from my party. Is it a revolutionary idea? Nah. I mean, Hal kind of had his own comeuppance, albeit much later in Sun and Moon. But I don't recall him having an entirely new lineup as a means of becoming more powerful. I wish the guy would have tossed out his starter though, honestly, because that would have really sealed the deal with how distraught he was to losing to Bede. Good development overall though. Also, something that's pretty interesting is that my wife just went through the ghost gym at this stage, but for me, it's the fighting gym. I didn't realize the version differences extended that deeply and I think I'll try to keep an eye out for more changes like that if I can. So you'll have noticed that the last 10 minutes or so of this video have followed a very simple formula. Gym, route to the next gym, gym, route, gym, route, gym. And I wanna make this perfectly clear. This is the perfect pacing for me. Sprinkles of storyline while I blaze a trail through the gyms and pump up my team is excellent. I've never liked it when a Pokemon story gets full of itself because more often than not, they're just not well-written enough to justify wasting time on. I get that they're oftentimes written to appeal to younger people, but as an adult fan who's played the franchise for 25 years, I'd rather just boomer my way through the gyms and make my team strong. That's not to say that a Pokemon story absolutely cannot be written to appeal to both kids and adults. I mean, look at Shrek. I'd still watch that shit today. But given the Pokemon series track record, I'm not super stoked for when the game inevitably pivots towards story time before I can continue on my gym excursion. So the fighting gym has the same kind of challenge as the ghost gym and shield. Basically, you have to take these teacups for a spin down to the bottom, which is done by rotating your control stick. Nothing extraordinary, but still kind of neat. The gym leader here uses a Machamp, which Dynamaxes into this hulking monstrosity. This mirrors the special form which the previous gym leader had with his Dark Souls boss centipede. Apparently, these are known as Gigantamax forms, and there are only a handful of Pokemon in the game which have the potential to pull it off. I really like the idea of some Pokemon shifting even further, but getting your hands on them is a lot harder to do without the DLC, unfortunately. So if I did have a Machamp, it more than likely wouldn't be able to achieve the form that this gym leader's did, unless I got incredibly lucky when finding an already Gigantamaxed form out in the wild area after collecting all of the gym badges. With the DLC though, I could feed a regular Machamp some special soup or whatever to cause it to achieve that form. That kind of blows, but whatever. So we pop back out to Not Hop, which is very pleasant. 
Instead, we get Sonia, who's here on some more Dynamax research. She's going on about some mural in this town's runes too, when suddenly there's an explody boom sound in the distance from the runes direction. Well, turns out Bede has decided that destroying a bunch of ancient graffiti is the best way to obtain more wishing stars. To do this, he's borrowed the chairman's Pokemon. So I throat chop every single one of his Pokemon in the hopes that I could maybe throat chop him too, but no dice there. Then the chairman and his assistant come running up to scold Bede. Uh, uh, uh. No destroying the ancient ruins, little beater. My favorite part about this is Bede asking if they stood in the way of a Pokemon Simple Beam, which is about the funniest Pokemon-related insult I think I've seen in a game. Well, it turns out that justice does exist, as they take away Bede's wishing stars and tell him that he can't participate in the gym challenge anymore. Awesome. But now I've got to try to predict the trajectory of the tragedy here. Either Bede kidnaps the wishing stars and uses them to try to prove that he knows what he's doing while unleashing disaster, or Rose or his assistant use the stars to do the same thing, except more evilly. I'm leaning heaviest towards the latter one there. Though that said, Sonya then launches into this mini-speech about how Bede has no family and how the chairman took him under his wing. So Bede has only ever fought for the chairman to make him proud. So maybe Bede will go down the route of proving himself or revenge. We'll see. Well, after this, the mural crumbles, revealing a couple of perfectly placed statues, basically depicting the same kind of imagery that the tapestry depicted back in Hammerlock. I just like how Sonya makes this expression like everything makes perfect sense now, but then she goes, hey, it's the same thing as the tapestries. I don't know what this means. Good research. So we take a ridiculously short trip over to the next gym town, Balone, Balonlea, oh shit. Again, this is one of the coolest towns that I've seen aesthetically. I really love the way that it looks and I'm pretty damn happy about that. So we carry on through this mystical town, grabbing some items, talking to a man who wants to be a Pokemon, meeting with Marnie, grabbing a man's love ball. Then we start on the gym challenge, which is your standard string of trainers, but with the added twist of quiz questions. If I answer something right, I get a stat boost. If I answer something wrong, I get a decrease. All right, that's an okay twist, I guess. If you stand your ground, it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. Ah, the old George Zimmerman defense. So yeah, the questions which this old lady brigade asks ranges from what's fairy week to, to what was the previous trainer's name, to what's my favorite food for breakfast? I'm sorry, what? How the fuck am I supposed to know that? I mean, if you're gonna ask me a trivia question and you wanna make it difficult, why not make it something like, what kind of Pokemon appears down this route, or something? So I push on into Opal's old lady cave where she stands ready to fight off a hernia. I was hoping that I'd get to watch her shuffle in at the speed of two snails pushing three snails, but I guess we'll just have to settle for her napping in the center. Well, her questions aren't much better as she just flings bullshit at me. Like there was a little boy in this town who said to me before all of this that she always tells him to wear more pink, and she tells me that I should wear more pink as well. So what's her favorite color? It's purple, dude. Right. So instead of quiz questions, why not just have her spin a wheel of buffs and debuffs, and whatever it lands on is what my Pokemon gets. That seems just as fair, but more fun. So after we get our badge, Opal tells us that we failed her test, meaning that she's been looking for a replacement gym leader since a stiff breeze is danger level four for her in her old age. Let's think for a moment. Who wears pink, is overly dramatic, and tends to assert themselves in a way that gets annoying? Yeah, all right. So he's probably gonna take that gym over and make it into a psychic one, which is sort of in line with what I said before, but we are still missing a gym leader now. So we run into Hop again, who seems to be back to his former self, though with a brand new team again. We take him on for, I don't know, I think the sixth time, before he runs ahead to the next gym. I guess we got to relish the idea of him being behind us for two whole gyms, which is better than nothing. Well, after quite a trek in comparison to the route to Opal's gym, we make it to this quiet, snowy city. I dig this place a lot also. Damn, dude, that's like three towns that I've really liked now. Well, the gym for me is the Rock Gym, again, differentiating from Shield's Ice Gym. I'm not gonna lie, I'd probably have preferred the Ghost and Ice Gems, because I like the gym leader's looks a lot more than what I got. Plus, Ice seems a lot easier to thrash over Rock. I am woefully underprepared for Rock with my team. 
I guess there just hasn't been a single grass type that I've really vibed with. I can't get Gibble yet from Shield, which is the ground type that I want, and I can't get Koma O yet, which is the main fighting type that I'd be interested in. Anyways, Hop is here ahead of me again, but he actually lost to the gym, which is exactly what I was hoping would happen. That is perfect. Not only does it promote more growth of his character, it actually makes me feel better about my own achievements. Well done, Game Freak. So the Rock Gym has me navigating through the thing using these blow torches to not fall into pitfalls, which seems like a pretty standard gym setup from nearly any generation. Though I did try to smartass my way through the thing with the heavy duty boots. But that didn't work. It'd be kind of funny if it did though, even if it didn't make sense. I'd say that overall this gym kind of sucks. Since basically if you do fall, you just do the thing again from whichever checkpoint you got to last. Either way, we take on Gordy, who's the chunkier version of Milo from the start of the game. He does give me a bit more trouble than the other leaders, but I still haven't had a Pokemon knocked out at this stage by a gym leader. I do gotta say, it's weird getting Rock Tomb this late in the game as my TM reward. I guess I just always associate it with the TM from Brock at the first gym in Kanto, at least in Fire Red and Leaf Green. Alright, so you know when we exit the gym, there's gonna be somebody waiting out here for us. It's just the formula. I honestly have to admit that I don't mind it because it keeps the story in the back of the player's mind while they collect badges. The issue here is that Sonya wants to take us to a restaurant. And I shit you not, there's a fucking ancient tapestry sitting on the wall in the background of this Denny's. Are you kidding me? That's what they came up with? I mean, fuck, if it cost me an extra 10 minutes, I'd rather a customer be overheard talking about some hidden runes that were just discovered. I mean, good God. And there isn't even an explanation. Like, the owner doesn't come out and go, My uncle was an art collector before passing on, and he wanted me to have this. I chose to display this timeless piece of art here in me pride and joy, me restaurant. It's just here. Imagine walking into an Applebee's, ordering your all-you-can-eat riblets or whatever the fuck, and then glancing around at the countless heaps of sports memorabilia just to see the fucking Bill of Rights nestled on the back wall between a University of Michigan flag and a Detroit Red Wings hockey puck. I'm so distraught over this. But it only gets worse. We're sitting here in front of the baths, because there never won't be baths in a Pokemon game, and Sonya's like, Yes, the two heroes used to bathe here. Say, do you two think you could be the new heroes? What the fuck? I mean, this plot wasn't very subtle to begin with, but Jesus Christ. Why not just have the ancient heroes be one-to-one -one replica photographs of the main character and Hop at this stage? That's the only way I could think of to make it less subtle than this. But yeah, this whole conversation gives us an excuse to grab Hop by the ankle and shake him for his lunch money again in a Pokemon battle. At which stage does he realize that he just lost to the gym that I just faced? Probably never. So we head down the icy river route before running into more Team Loud grunts harassing the exact same doctor who apparently is on a cross-country trip to provide me with bike parts as defeating him nets me an upgrade which lets me cycle on water. Another 20,000 ways to go about this upgrade, but yeah, I guess doing the exact same thing is the easiest. So I cycle across this frozen waterscape, fighting off fishermen and swimmers who are dressed like it's not sub-zero temperatures. I get that you designed one male and one female swimmer model, but did you really have to sprinkle them where it's hailing when they're wearing either no shirt or a bikini? I guess it makes about as much sense as the tropical beach chairs and the regular berry tree out here also, though. So we make it to the next town where the dark gym is supposed to be, and the gate is closed. Well, Marnie is hanging out around the corner, literally with an eyesight of everyone complaining about the city gates being closed. And she goes, Oi, come here! So I walk 10 feet around the corner and she goes, I know of a secret entrance to this place. The secret entrance is an opening in the wall. No secret passcode, no sewers or tunnels. Just a hole in the wall with a Pokemon Center in plain sight. Can we... can we just try? Like, sure, it's convenient. But you could have easily had the aforementioned password or like a sewer system that actually has a little undercity with a Pokemon Center attached. Just fuck, man. Try. It's all I ask. So the actual town of Spike Muth is Marnie's home, meaning that Team Yell is also situated here. The music is decent and the looks are pretty cool, but the entire town has nobody in it besides these Team Yell grunts which keep challenging you as you work your way to the gym leader. Basically, the entire town is a gym, which is a neat concept, but I really feel like the whole place is a missed opportunity. 
Like when you beat a couple of grunts, one of them goes, Hey, follow the neon signs. The neon signs point in one fucking direction, because it's literally the only way that you can go besides the way that you came. Really? Like, again, so many ways that you could have done this, but you made it a straight shot down an alley to get to the gym leader. It's literally the most basic gym of the game, on par with many older generations' first gyms. Why not have CD characters which offer to sell you enhancements for your Pokémon if you buy the correct one? If you buy the incorrect one, the item hurts your Pokémon or gives them a debuff in the next battle. A little like the Fairy Gym. If you refuse to buy, you fight the merchant. Or how about somebody mugs you for a chunk of money that you have to chase before others jump you? What if the Team Yell members which you defeat wind up joining and cheering for you, adopting a new color scheme before it leads into a little turf war between the old members and the new members? It could even spill into the remainder of the game in which you become an almost mob boss-esque entity which inspires your particular faction of gang members to focus on whichever option that you choose. You could have them focus on helping people, or you could have them focus on making you money, or you could have them focus on something in between those two. I don't know, the possibilities laid out in Pokemon games are potentially limitless, and yet this is what we get. Well, about as confusing as the Gym City layout is this scene where the gym leader is introduced. Listen to this, this sounds like booing, right? It seems like they're booing him, but it also seems like they're happily cheering. I, uh, all right. Well, this whole place is locked down because Team Yell is actually comprised of gym leaders from Spike Mood's gym, and they decided to try to suit up and help out Marnie with her challenge for whatever reason. Locking down the city means that other trainers wouldn't be able to get in her way by challenging the gym here. Uh, so if we go off what the lady in Nessa's hometown told us, there definitely seems to be some kind of Galar region regulations on gyms, right? Like, they'll demote a gym leader for losing too much, which makes sense. But they're all right with an entire gym just closing down to push their city's prodigy out or whatever. Why haven't any officials stepped in to clear this whole thing up? So yeah, we fight the gym leader, Piers, in probably the most interesting gym fight in the game just by comparison to the rest. So at least there's that. He starts off by saying, Yeah, this gym kinda sucks. But then he goes full rocker mode and starts screaming into his microphone about which moves his Pokémon has. Tactical genius. Additionally, he doesn't Dynamax his Pokémon, which means that we don't either. It's really not such a bad thing, as Dynamaxing has gotten stale by this stage. And lastly, the gym music is unique compared to the rest, which I very much appreciate. All in all, horrible gym, piss-poor implementation of what could have been fresh ideas, and the only saving grace is the differences between this leader and the rest. So it turns out that this guy is Marnie's big brother, which explains a lot. He wants her to take over the gym in his stead, but she's aiming at becoming the league champion. So after I beat Piers, she gears up to take him on. Meanwhile, at the start of the town, some kind of explosion is heard outside. This is the third explosion of the game. This guy comes running into the town after the gates have been opened to tell me that there's some trouble down Route 9. And so we run out and Leon is here to investigate. Here's something that I actually love. I'm a child in this game, right? As always in Pokemon. But in every other Pokemon game, every adult relies on some 11-year-old kid or whatever to take care of the horrible problems usually created by full-blown adults. It's always been a silly trope that makes me resent the adults of the game. Well, in this one, there was a major issue at the power plant type thing earlier on, and the chairman tells us that the adults will handle it. That's great. And basically the same thing happens here with Leon. He's like, hey dude, I'm the champion. Don't worry about any of this, just go on and complete your gym challenge. That is perfect. And it's all I ask for, honestly, because the adults have now told the child that they will sort out the mess. Even if I do get involved now, it's because I, the child, have chosen to do so. This is so much better than the adults going, Please, child, you must go to the Forbidden Cave with the ancient beast of a Pokémon and take care of it. Oh, the Elite Four? The League Champion? The Gym Leaders? No, 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 no. They're busy. They have shit to do. So what's happening is that there's more wild Pokémon suddenly Dynamaxing around the area, and Leon is taking them out. 
which is fine by me because it saves me from having to watch three minutes of cutscene per battle. So we head to the final gym, the Dragon Gym. Well, we're out of ideas, so this gym is just three back-to-back -back doubles battles, followed by the leader who also fights in doubles. Here's the deal. This dude's the Dragon Gym Leader, supposedly, as everyone has said 24,000 times. On top of that, he claims to control the weather before we start. This guy has two Dragon Pokémon. The other two are Ground and Rock. And the only weather that he controls are Sandstorms. Now that said, this is a very good fight. I've said it a thousand times, but Gym Leaders being constrained to a single Pokémon type is pretty silly to prove yourself as a competent opponent. All you usually need is a single Pokémon to counter most gyms. But this is the first time in this game where any of my Pokémon fainted, and he took out three of them. It's actually a great battle, and I would have been in trouble if he had a full team. Welcome, Welcome to PlayStation, PlayStation 5. So we beat the guy, and Hop comes in to challenge him next, unfortunately. Then we head out, and Sonya gets handed a lab coat, making her a professor. People have been doing this all wrong, going to school and all that shit. Just buy a lab coat, dude. Makes you a professor right away. So I check my poke jobs as I have been, because I always get access to more of them after beating a gym. Well, every time the requirements allow for more and more Pokémon to join the jobs. Like the first few jobs have a max of three Pokémon allowed to join, and then it goes up little by little. Like after the seventh badge, I could send like nine or ten Pokémon on a job. Well, after the 8th gym, I can send a staggering 30 Dragon Pokémon on a job. There are not 30 Dragon Pokémon in the game, at least not without DLC. And even if I collected the 28 or so that exist in the vanilla game, I'd have to scour and trade for them. I know you could argue that I can just get duplicates, but are you out of your mind? Not only do I not just want to catch random dupes, it's also an insane amount of dragons. I know that I can just send one Pokémon on a job, but come on. So, oddly enough, again, disaster seems to be springing up around me with these Dynamaxing Pokémon mirroring the past catastrophe which plagued the Galar region. But again, as a kid, I'm told to continue my Pokémon League experience while the adults handle it. And again, I appreciate this. It's almost like I'm proving my worth as a trainer before assisting with something so dangerous. Whereas in previous games, I would go save the world before taking on the Pokémon League. And I feel like that's just a design philosophy which never evolved until now. Because in the first two games, that kind of worked. You'd take out Team Rocket and foil their plans and move seamlessly into the endgame to face down the League. It worked there because Team Rocket was almost a mob-type entity that was just a group of assholes. And it wasn't so much that it was an ancient deity that had come back to take over the world or whatever the fuck. It started to get silly with Sapphire onwards, though as looming disaster always needed to be thwarted by pretty much primarily you as a kid who didn't even have all of his badges most of the time. I will note that I believe that Black and White did a pretty decent job of melding everything together, though, to some degree. Now, while we're completely unfocused, let's jump back again to Dynamax Raid Battles. I kind of swept all of this under the rug of boring before when I touched on this topic. Well, later on, when you get to the five-star raid battles, they become more difficult and interesting but also nearly impossible to do on your own. And it's not for a lack of skill on my end, but because the game requires you to have NPC allies if you don't go looking for other players online, you're fucked a good 95% of the time, because the NPCs are actual garbage with the intelligence of low-level wild Pokémon. I tried my hand a few times with my wife at some five-star raid battles, and out of the 10 or so battles that we tried, we successfully pulled off one because the NPCs bring Pokémon that are weak to the Pokémon type that we're facing, or shit like a literal Magikarp. And when a Pokémon faints four times, you lose the battle outright. No last man standing, no limiting respawns to zero, and hoping that the last couple of Pokémon can survive and win. And I haven't figured out if Game Freak just didn't care enough to program some semblance of smart AI decision-making, or if they purposefully made the AI this dumb just to encourage online play. I'm honestly leaning towards the latter because the Battle Tower has some pretty well-scripted AI that face you down. But these NPCs completely hamstring this entire endeavor a vast majority of the time. Even when they somehow manage to bring a halfway decent Pokémon against our foe, they'll spend their turns using moves which increase their speed or the like a good chunk of the time instead of getting attacks off which slowly break these giant Pokémon shields. 
And the worst part about all of this is that there are such simple solutions to make the raid battles good. Or at least better. I could opt to take four of my own Pokémon. I could opt to start the battle with just me and my wife. We could literally have taken out several of the Pokémon by ourselves 2v1. But even that is out of the realm of possibility as I can try to start a battle with just myself and my wife and the game goes, hey, you only got two. You want us to find you some NPCs? And I say, no, no, I don't want that. And the game doesn't start. So I think to myself, well, if I start it now, it'll let us play without NPCs. I mean, it just asked us if we wanted them. And yet the battle fires up with asshole one and two in tow, sending out their piles of actual lint and last night's leftovers in the hope that they don't get clobbered by a Pokemon the size of Wisconsin. But the raid battle fun doesn't stop there. Of course it doesn't. Because after you've wasted an hour trying to re-roll for a successful AI team, a daunting fact still looms over the player. These battles are fundamentally flawed. When you get higher up in the difficulty levels of raids, Pokémon begin putting up shields, like I mentioned before. Shields are barriers which range from two to five ticks from what I can tell. A standard attack takes away one tick. A Dynamaxed attack takes away two. So if a Pokémon puts up a five tick shield, it will only break if all four Pokémon attack the shield, and if one of those Pokémon are Dynamaxed. This means if an NPC decides to dick around and start performing useless moves, you've wasted a shield tick shattering potential. I initially thought that after they get hit once or twice, they put up a shield. But it's so much worse than that. It's when they get to a specific HP stage. So basically, if one Pokémon does 95% of the HP required to hit that shield stage of the battle, then if the Dynamax Pokémon goes next, well, it does a very minimal amount of damage since there's an invisible barrier preventing the enemy from taking any further damage despite it getting pounded by a very large, powerful attack which should decimate its health. This is by far one of the worst systems from a fundamental level I have ever witnessed shoved into a video game, especially one that's had one and a half years to balance and correct it. And this is my biggest problem with Game Freak and Nintendo. We now live in an age where games are put out early. Fine. It's not my favorite, but I get it. The problem is that we see indie devs working their asses off a lot of the time to balance and fix and make things as right as they can when issues come up. But the bigger that a game gets, the more likely that they're going to drop any quality of life patches and focus on shoving extra paid content instead. I fucking refuse to pay for DLC to a game that still, after all this time, hasn't been updated with changes which would benefit the players from a company as large as Game Freak is. In fact, if I were a more cynical person, I'd say that they haven't fixed this stuff to encourage people to buy Nintendo Online so that they can catch these Dynamax Pokémon. But I'm not saying that. I would never imply that Game Freak intentionally hasn't fixed raid battles to sell more Nintendo Online subs. And anybody who thinks that Game Freak intentionally hasn't fixed raid battles to sell more Nintendo Online subs is obviously overthinking this whole ordeal. <laughs> Here comes the Torkoal. Torkoal. All right, now that that wild ride is over, it's time to head through these snowy-ass mountains filled with trainers to the city of London. It's the most impressive one so far in terms of scale, though I prefer a few of the other cities aesthetically to it. Still, it's a pretty cool city at a glance. That said, it's fucking empty. I mean, we've had the technology to have large groups of NPCs milling around for a long while now. Look at Paris in Pokemon X and Y. Plenty of people moving around, hustling and bustling from place to place. This city is a ghost town of occasional NPCs popping in like it's Cyberpunk 2077. I guess the Switch just can't handle draw distances of further than 10 feet. Or, hear me out, the game was developed for the 3DS and Nintendo forced Game Freak to port it over to the Switch when it turned out the Switch was successful. That's my conspiracy theory. Oh wow, so many people. That's a little intimidating. Now from the way that things have sounded leading up until this point, it seems as if we're going to go through some kind of semi-finals process where we face down Marnie and Hop before the winner of the matches goes on to face Leon. Part of me wonders if losing to them would just reset the battles like nothing happened, or if there would be some kind of alternate universe type thing where these guys go on to face Leon instead. 
I'll never know for 100% sure because I have way too much pride to lose to these fuck sticks, but something tells me that Game Freak couldn't come up with a story that has branching paths and alternate endings if a gun was held to their head. Still, I do like taking on my rivals in an actual official capacity rather than just before I take on the League. Alright, is there a League in this one with an Elite Four? If there is, will Bede reappear as some kind of Elite Four member since he went off the radar after he was kidnapped by Grandma? Or is it just gonna be Leon? Guess we'll find out. So yeah, goes pretty much exactly as I said, with Marnie and then Hop. Very easy battles, nothing compared to the 8th Gym's doubles. I will say that the music for both fights was amazing, though. So after our semi-final matches, we meet up with Hop and Leon, and make plans for dinner at a fancy-ass hotel. Well, several hours roll by and Leon still hasn't shown up, which is worrying for Hop. While well, Piers saunters in to tell us that Leon was gonna be late since he had to swing by Rose Tower first for something. This worries Hop for whatever reason, meaning that this is going to be the transition into our final story chunk before we fight Leon. Piers agrees to take us up to meet Leon at Rose Tower, and he says that he'll round up Team Yell to raise a ruckus for some reason. I mean, at this stage, Leon isn't in any trouble. He just seems like he's going to meet with Chairman Rose, I assume. So why bring a bunch of punks to come fuck shit up? Whatever. I'm already ready for how stupid this will inevitably be. So we pop outside and the gang's all here. I still don't understand why they're framing this like it'll be a big showdown despite the only information that we've gotten at this stage being along the lines of, hey, your brother's at the tower. Well, here to prove these future seeing profits correct is the chairman's assistant who goes, oh, I'm afraid I can't let you do that. You see, the monorail is locked down and can only be unlocked by select personnel who have a specific key. And I've given that key to one of the specially selected staff members here. You ever worry about face palming so hard that your hand goes through your fucking skull by accident? Why, why even have a main conflict? Like, if you're literally going to phone it in this hard, that you're basically using the same villain logic as Pokemon Red, then why even have a plot? People will still buy your game, I promise. Pokemon is literally too big to fail as long as you make some semblance of an attempt, Game Freak. Just spare me. Then he turns around and runs the fuck away. My willpower is being sapped in real life by a video game. Yeah, he runs away, you battle him, he runs, you battle, he runs, you battle, and then he runs really far this time. Then you make it to the monorail station where he joins you with his three clones. So Pierce takes his microphone out from his asshole and then starts screaming words into it with no instruments around. This attracts all eight people in London to come running down the stairs and trample the gang of clones until we get the key in the mayhem. If this sounds stupid, please be aware that someone who wasn't me wrote this game script. Yeah! We're having fun! This is the best summer vacation ever! What a jarring theme for what's supposed to be a dire situation. Well, this keeps dragging on as Pokemon continues to be Pokemon up this elevator. And the bad guys pop in to tell us how Rose Tower is the foundation of a bunch of subsidiaries which conduct business around the Galar region. Because corporations are evil. I wish I didn't call this a mile away. But alas, we continue to ascend the elevator while getting interrupted occasionally by various insurance and construction agency members, before we space jam our way to the top floor. Here stands Rose's assistant who's pissed off enough to invoke the entire city of Pittsburgh to attack my Pokémon. Fortunately, I've got a big frog that evolved from a dick, so we're good. Well, we get to the end of the line here, and the chairman is hashing things out with Leon. Apparently, they did not notice the Pokemon the size of skyscrapers battling behind them. Rose explains that in a thousand years, the Calamity, or whatever, will be upon the Galar region again. And if they don't prepare for that inevitability, humanity will be doomed. Alright, you've actually got my attention. But this is all that comes from this. Leon says, yeah, well, fuck the people in a thousand years. That's like a thousand years from now. Now let me go fight in the championships, dude. And then we go back to the hotel. You know that literally all of this would have been solved by the mere existence of cell phones, right? But apparently we forgot we had one. And so did Hop. And so did Piers. And so did Marnie. 
and so did everyone. Who will? Hopefully nothing interferes with the championships tomorrow. So here's an interesting point of order. When a challenger makes it through the gauntlet that I've made it through, they then have to fight the gym leaders to a degree again. Basically, each leader here gets placed somewhere on a tournament bracket along with the player. And every round, someone is defeated until the last man standing gets the opportunity to face the champion. That's actually kind of a cool concept, truth be told. So it's almost like an Elite 3 now, except with some familiarity involved with the upcoming foes. I'm honestly not opposed to it. Though that said, this entire tournament bracket is kind of flawed. I mean, if you have eight gym leaders and there's nine competitors typically, how does that work out? I mean, I guess a gym leader just kind of chooses to not participate or something. And I couldn't help but notice that Opal isn't around the backstage here, which also makes me wonder what Beat is up to. Well, that didn't take long. And my prediction about him transforming into the psychic gym leader instead of the fairy one was wrong because he just uses fairy now. But he does burst in here to basically plead to battle you, claiming that he'll retire from being a Pokemon trainer if he loses. I'd say that I enjoy that he went from being this overly smug douchebag to being a desperate shell of his former self, but it doesn't seem like he's learned any humility and that he's just doing this out of desperation. Either way, we slap him one last time before the audience demands that he not retire or whatever. He accepts this and then goes back to being a fairy leader. Whatever. I guess this makes more sense for an Elite Four than the three that I would have had to face. Though I still have to wonder how this would have gone if there had actually been eight gym leaders plus the challenger. I mean, that's just gotta be a weird bracket to make. So first we take on Nessa, who gives me more trouble than I thought she would, honestly. Though that may be partially due to me having my fire Pokemon in front. Afterwards, the standings update, showing that the fire gym leader lost to the dark leader. The dragon gym leader obviously beat Milo's dumbass grass team, and fighting beat out Rock, which seems about right. So we're taking on fighting and then moving onward to dragon, because there's no way that dragon loses to dark. You know, I thought it was cool that the fighting gym leader's bare feet made these slapping noises against the stone because, you know, she's barefooted. But then it makes the exact same sound on grass, too. Anyways, I don't know why these guys don't have full teams of six, seeing as this is supposed to be a big serious match where they're aiming to become the champion. But I'm guessing that no one has the capacity at Game Freak to think that hard about this kind of stuff. I guess it wouldn't have mattered with the fighting gym leader, though, seeing as I literally one-shot every single one of her Pokemon. Well, the Dragon Man beat the Dark Man, so it's time to see what this guy does 1v1. So what does the Master of All Dragons do? Well, he sends out a fucking Fire Turtle. I don't understand. I almost feel like they decided to shoehorn in the whole weather-changing aspect to this gym leader, but then realize that there are little to no dragons that actually change the weather this way. But yeah, we mow through him, though a lot more slowly than the fighting leader. So now we've finally made it to Leon. I've got to say, I'm actually pretty excited about this matchup. Uh, yeah, attention all Pokemon guests to the stadium and shit. So I was arguing with Leon about how some bad shit was about to happen in a thousand years in the future or something. And, uh, he did not want to listen, so I made it happen now. You are welcome. I am out of witty quips. This game has broken me. Ah, uh, yes, we've got the Pokemon. Check. We've got a new untested mechanic. Check. We've got eight gyms. Check. All right, ship it. So Leon takes off to try to stop the chairman from bringing about the so-called darkest day again. And Hop and I run off to the woods at the start of the game to capture a legendary Pokemon. I'm surprised though, I haven't gotten a Master Ball in this game yet. I'm waiting for Hop to pull one out of his asshole and go, look, I snagged one of these at Rose Tower. So we stumble further into the woods before discovering the Legend of Zelda. In the background, we hear the legendary Pokemon continue to do its best immigrant song impression. Then we pick up an actual literal weapon to use against Rose, which only excites me more for the possibility of a Pokemon gun. So we fly back to Hammerlock where the center of all this madness is taking place. It's here that Raihan, the dragon gym leader, tells us that they've evacuated the city, so no need to worry. This is blatantly untrue as I biked past half the city literally doing the exact same shit that they were doing before because fuck it. The one time that you needed to phase NPCs out of existence and you can't even do that right. Now go! I'll stand here menacingly and pretend to evacuate more people. So Rose's assistant goes from being belligerently arrogant to whining to you to help her save the chairman. 
Apparently, the goofy bastard decided to awaken the ancient Pokémon which caused the darkest day with its energy in order to harvest said energy so that the world can continue to have energy. Or something. Well, said energy is now causing Pokémon to Dynamax and Rampage around the region. So we get down to Rose who explains that they've been feeding the Wishing Stars to the ancient Pokémon to awaken it, hoping to harvest its energy and then control it with Leon's help, all so that the world can go on with everlasting energy. It's a noble pursuit with a misguided antagonist, and I guess it's not the worst motivation in the world as much as I hate to admit it. Though him bringing it about that much sooner is kind of short-sighted. But this guy's music is fucking epic. Whoops. 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 And whoops. So yeah, the chairman apologizes before letting you go to see how Leon has gotten on with this ancient Pokemon. This Eternatus. I'm willing to bet that he did not capture it. So we head up and yeah, he's not caught. But Leon does try to catch it in a normal Pokeball. Right on. Well, that doesn't work. So I fight it next and am physically incapable of throwing a Pokeball, so I guess I got no room to talk. Then it turns big. And the game proves that 2v1 Dynamax raids are possible. Wait, we can't attack. So yeah, never mind. We summon the Sword and Shield Legendary Wolves to come fight with us and the game checks to make sure that we have four bodies here before we can continue to fight again. This is basically an interactive cutscene displaying a trash mechanic that needed to be reworked in the earliest stages, I imagine. Probably cool for kids, though. Well, eventually we can try to catch this thing. So I do what Leon did and throw a regular Pokeball at it. But mine works because I'm better. Explains why we didn't get a Master Ball. Then Sif and his wolf buddy leap into the sun. Three days pass by and it turns out that Rose turned himself into the police for doing what he believed in. Then it's finally time to face Leon. Game Freak has managed to muster a solid 20 NPCs to cheer for me on my way in to get to the match, which I'm impressed by. Usually the game lags when we get too much action happening at once, but they managed to pull it off here at a stunning 55 FPS. So the final battle is pretty good. Music's good as always. Actually, this game's music has probably some of my favorite themes in any Pokemon game, which is saying a lot, seeing as Pokemon games have historically had some pretty great music. Anyways, this dude has a pretty solid lineup that manages to down a majority of my team. And the final part has me fighting fire with fire just to assert my dominance, leading to both of our Pokemon fainting at the exact same time. That was pretty rad. Then Leon crowns me as champion and throws his hat into the air and the credits roll. And that's it. Well... No, no it's not. There's more after the credits. <sighs> I, yeah, yeah, okay, so I'm the champion. I wake up at my mom's place and eat my sugar-frosted mini-wheats. God, I love sugar-frosted mini-wheats. My mom pats me on the head and sends me out with my mini pizza lunchable with the chocolate icing and M&M pizza dessert. But then the kind old lady professor stops by to give me my very own master ball. Today's gonna be a good day. I decide to go play in the woods before finding my good buddy Hop waiting in the clearing. He explains that he was drawn here by some force, and I agree because options don't exist. So we have another battle before Sonya comes in and gives me a signed copy of her book that she wrote. It doesn't have many pictures in it, so I get bored. Then this penis-haired man and shield-haired man come in with their butler's outfits to tell Sonya that they gave her book a one-star review on Barnes & Noble's website because it's filled with lies. Swordward, Shieldbert. Nah, no, I'm done. No, I'm serious, I'm not walking through this fucking afterthought. This rigmarole of tedious bullshit gameplay and story packaged neatly with a little bow accentuated with a lipstick kiss from Game Freak. I'll spare a brief overview because I actually slogged through it and you literally visit every gym again and fight a Dynamax Pokemon before Tweedledee and Tweedledum piss off the shield Pokemon at the top of the tower from before. And that's it. You whip your Master Ball at not Sif, and these two morons are so goddamn impressed that they copy and paste the exact same dialogue from Diamond about having never seen a battle so amazing. They turn themselves in, Hop chases the shield Pokemon and claims his participation medal in this whole game, somehow cementing his place as the loosest definition of the word hero ever displayed in any form of media. You fight him one last time despite it being a couple hours later max and his Pokemon are now all near or at level 70. Then he says he wants to go around helping people however he can, and for some reason his profession of choice is to become a Pokemon professor. 
which is like the 10th most helpful thing that you can be in terms of traveling and rescuing people wherever you find them. But that doesn't matter, because this way history repeats itself with Hop becoming a professor and his rival becoming a champion, which is the inverse of what happened with Leon and Sonya. The end. Pokemon Sword is, uh, well, it's a Pokemon game. It has some very high highs and some absolute valleys of lows. The story exists, the mechanics are naturally pretty fun when the extra stuff isn't lumped in. The problem with the Pokemon formula is that it's as addictive as it is. And I'm fully willing to acknowledge that at the end of the day, I'm probably going to have fun with any given Pokemon game as long as it doesn't hinder me too much while I'm trying to catch Pokemon and raise a team. And that's the biggest problem with critiquing something like Pokemon. Because let's face it, is it okay that Game Freak left out 231 Pokemon and then never added them back in slowly over updates, and yet they still managed to shovel out $30 DLC? Absolutely not. It's a horrible practice that I honest to God can't blame anyone for choosing to boycott the game over. Hell, I did for a year and a half. But did I have such a horrendous time that I dreaded firing up the game every day? Not at all. Raising a team is fun. Catching Pokemon is fun. And as long as a Pokemon game follows that formula with minimal hindrance, it's going to be hard to outright say that it's bad. But still, this one does have many pitfalls that make it hard to recommend over the older handheld copies of the other games in the franchise. One of the biggest things that I touched on just a tiny amount throughout this video is that this game is horribly unpolished when it comes to quite a few things. The draw distance is horrendous. It's like the Switch can't even handle more than 20 entities on screen at a given time. And 20 is being generous. The game came out in 2019, not 2004. It's somewhat forgivable when you're out in the wild and Pokemon are popping into existence, but it's downright laughable in bigger cities when you look around and feel like Game Freak predicted COVID. Furthermore, every single Pokemon Center might as well be a clone. I talked to all of the NPCs and I think maybe one of them offered to give me something or a trade or something like that. Maybe. They all look the same regardless of location, regardless of what the surrounding area looks like. The only real difference is which items are sold. It's kind of embarrassing when you think about it. NPCs and trainers are haphazardly placed around areas where they don't make a lot of sense. Like the part where I discussed the trainers which were clearly dressed for tropical weather out in this frozen tundra. The animations, as always, are completely awful. Like there's hardly ever any proper facial animation to express what's happening. There are so many scenarios where the game says that something is happening through text, but the character animations can't be asked to keep up. What is this, a fucking early access indie game? This is embarrassing for how much money this franchise rakes in. It's even more embarrassing when Game Freak cited that the reason for so many Pokemon being cut from the game is due to them having to put in high quality animations for every single Pokemon. These high quality animations consist of shit like Pokemon hopping a little bit in battle to convey a kick, or kicking to convey a punch. This is particularly irritating when Game Freak went on to explain that they would have to redo all of the Pokemon models for Switch. Yes, you do have to do that. It's called literally creating a $60 game. It's called having the funding to do exactly that. How is this ever an excuse from a developer of one of the largest franchises in the world? I know the amount you can get immersed in a Pokemon game can only go so far, but holy shit. They recycled movement expressions from Sun and Moon for so many of the NPCs. Again, adding more cement to my idea that this was a 3DS game. I mean, I still felt somewhat immersed in Sun and Moon just with the way that various things were presented, like Po Town where Team Skull trashed the place. While a lot of the settings in this game have a wow factor initially, the paint chips away when you realize just how shallow everything is. And the absolute worst problem with all of this is that I could honest to God forgive these transgressions if many of the decisions made around developing this game were shined to perfection. If you could wear different uniforms during big matches. If every Pokemon from previous generations existed. If Dynamax battles weren't the most boring slog of bullshit hindered even further by trash tier AI and a shoddy battle system if any kind of effort went into the most basic decisions regarding animations. But all of that said, and I know this is kind of hard to shift into with how much shit that I just gave it, but I did have fun. There were amazing musical moments and city aesthetics. There were awesome fights and interesting mechanics. 
There were so many things to do despite the game being so streamlined with how it handled the gym system. And the way that you literally hyper-focused on the gyms until the story reared its ugly head was probably the best way to structure a story in my eyes. I've always said that I just want to do gym stuff in every given game. And Sword and Shield do that masterfully. So is Pokemon Sword as bad as I imagined it would be? No. But it got close. I'd sum it up again, but I really don't think I need to repeat myself. And the biggest problem is that people are going to buy the next one. And the one after that. And the one after that. Game Freak has nailed the core things that make Pokemon what it is. And I can't deny, no matter how hard I want to, that I do still have fun with every single version despite some being superior. It just sucks that we're at the whim of Game Freak slowly chipping away at the series, causing its fans to compromise. I didn't buy Sword for this long because I honest to God did not want to support the decisions the company made with the game. But I came to the realization that I could be a small voice on this platform, and that if we have enough of those, maybe we could eventually steer this franchise back to what it could and should be. It's easier to justify a handheld $40 series of games having flaws, having choices that were obviously phoned in. It's a lot harder to justify the same series making poor decisions and costing $60 on a main console with a $30 DLC. I guess we'll just have to see how Pokemon Breath of the Wild Shadows Die Twice turns out. Thanks for watching. Feels weird coming off a three and a half hour video with a paltry one and a half ish one. But hey, more videos for you, less work for me. Anyways, I've got some shirts. You know it, I know it. Or you don't know it, and I do. Well, now you do, I guess. Still, I've got a Twitch where I stream every Monday, Tuesday, and Friday at a given time listed, uh, somewhere. I have a Twitter where I remember to tweet things that aren't videos on occasion. I have a Discord where people chat. I chat. You chat? I mean, you can. You're invited. And I have a Patreon. And that's it. Have a good one.